Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today's video is going to be kind of fun, not going to lie. It's about me making a Crypt of the Necro Dancer clone. Well, kind of. The core mechanic is the same, but the levels are not procedurally generated and the game is a little more story driven and scripted. So let's go back to how it started. I wanted to make a Crypt of the Necro Dancer clone, obviously, and I was looking for that extra oomph, so to say. So I decided that I was going to join a game jam and adapt the core mechanic to whatever theme I was dealing with. Now, Mini Jam 75 was coming up, and I love Mini Jam because it adds a twist in that, as opposed to a normal game jam where you make a game in a lot of amount of time that has to fit a theme, yada yada yada, Mini Jam actually has two themes. They have an overarching theme, which is announced in advance of the beginning of the jam. In this case, it was Wisdom, hence the huge brain on my main character, and they have what they call a limitation, which is a little more mechanical. In this case, it was weight must be a mechanic. I kind of looked at what was being voted for on limitations, and I was really scared of one where all of the sounds in the game must be made by your mouth or something like that, but that one didn't go through, so yay. So when the jump started, I already knew I was going with the big brain theme, but figuring out how I was going to fit weight in took a little bit of mind bending. <laughs> the first day was very slow. I'd only made tiles and the player sprite and just started figuring out player movement. Which by the way, I have to give huge props to the team who made the original game. If you take a closer look at the sprites, you'll realize that there is only one animation for idle and one animation for moving. There is no separate sprites for directional movement, the sprite is just flipped when moving to the left and to the right. And it still looks very organic, which probably should be credited to how crisp the movement is programmatically. The jump trajectories just look very natural. Now, there is zero chance I could code something like those jumps and finish the game in 72 hours for a mini jump, which, spoiler alert, I still didn't, just because of a different reason. But for now, I had Godot's animation player to thank for saving me some time. I'd never used it for movement before, so my animations were nowhere near those of the original game. But what Animation Player essentially does is it allows us to set positions of where an actor is supposed to be in a given moment in the animation, and that's what's called keyframes, and then set different interpolations between those keyframes. So let's say we have a keyframe at the beginning of a jump and at the highest point in the jump. The way we want to interpolate between those is we want to start moving really fast at the beginning of the first keyframe, and then slow down when we are reaching the second keyframe. So early second day, I finished the animations and wrote the movement code. It was time to drop some music into the game and make sure the player had to move to the beat. For this, I used a modified version of my conductor node slash class I made for a rhythm game tutorial, shameless plug link in the comments. What it is, is a script on top of Godot's audio player that knows the song's BPM, and by keeping track of the song position, it sends out signals on every beat. So the plan for the enemy movement was that, that the game controller would iterate over its children and tell those of type enemy to move when it received the signal, and then the player would move separately from the enemies. When the player pressed a movement key, I would ask the conductor node how far off the closest beat we are, and if it's higher than some threshold, the player just doesn't move. So after the movement code, I made some better floor tiles and was ready to start working on the enemies. I decided that I would have the two basic slimes from the Crypt of the Necro Dancer, one that jumps in place and one that moves up and down. Here I made some very bad inheritance structure decisions, which would come to bite me in the behind on the next day. I knew that theoretically I could use the same movement animations for all of the actors. But for some reason, the fact that I wanted the sprites to be of different sizes got to me. So as opposed to just setting the sprite offset, which I totally forgot about, I saved the animation player as a separate scene and edited the animations individually for every non-standard size enemy. But for now, I had my first moving enemy and I was happy. The second day was ending, and as you might have noticed earlier, I drew a skeleton enemy and went to sleep. I'd have a lot to do on the next day. So a good rule for 48 and 72 hour game jams that you'll hear veteran developers repeating time and again is that you leave the last day of the jam for polish. 
as you can see that's definitely not the case here matter of fact i don't think it ever was the case for me i've submitted 18 games to game jams and there was never a morning on the last day when i woke up made a nice cup of coffee sat down in front of the computer and went hmm that pixel on the seventh frame of my monster attack animation is a little off let me fix that nope I'm always wide awake the second I open my eyes, knock over a couple of things on my sprint to the computer, and then work on an endless list of to-dos while cutting as many corners as possible. The first thing I did on the third day was implementing a skeleton enemy which would chase the player on every other beat if he got close enough. And now would be a good time to talk about how I was going to fit the game into the weight must be a mechanic limitation. I wanted to tie this into speeding up the music because that's always a fun mechanic for rhythm games. So you get wider, the game speeds up. I just had to figure out why you got wider in the first place. So what I came up with was that you were this philosopher king who got betrayed by his advisors who you then had to convince to get back on your side by sharing your wisdom so your brain shrunk and you got wider. The Crypt of the Necro Dancer also has these stair guardians that you need to defeat before you can get access to the next level. They are generally bigger monsters with a wider range of movement and attacks. So I wanted something like that. Each of the advisors in my game would get a guardian you had to defeat before you could convert them. I was going to model these after the Minotaur Guardians from the Crypt, who would run at you in a straight line, and if they missed you, they would keep running until they hit a wall. But hitting a wall mechanic seemed like extra work, and since I was holding out hope that I would finish this game in the measly six hours I had left, I was looking for a way uh, to simulate this behavior with fewer lines of code and frames of animation. What I came up with was alternating between intervals of chasing the player on every beat and resting for a couple of beats. These enemies wouldn't quite have the same impact, but they would still test the player's skill and allow them to develop strategies to defeat them consistently. So the level design was going to look like this. After starting in the throne room and going up the hallway, you would reach a central chamber with three different corridors leading to three different advisors. Defeat them and a portal opens up again in the central chamber, which allows you to go to the next level. And the problem in games like these, Crypt of the Necro Dancer Cadence of Hyrule, is that traversing the map when you're not fighting enemies is really not fun. Crypt of the Necro Dancer allows you to turn off on beat movement when you're in the lobby. I was going to make a teleporter to the area that the player would have to backtrack to three times otherwise. There would be a crystal next to each of the advisors that would break to reveal a rune circle which, when stepped on, would take you back to the central chamber. With this done, and about three hours left, I was on track to finish the first level by the end of the jam. I just had to design the last two corridors, populate them with some enemies, place the remaining two advisors there, and hook them up to the game controller to make sure the game knew when to speed up the music and when all three were converted. And maybe add it to be continued screen once that happened. Maybe. I still wasn't sure if I wanted to submit it with just one level, since then I could mark it as done in my mind and just move on to the next thing, but that decision was made for me. I'd finished the last room and booted up the game. This was supposed to be the run when it all came together. Instead, this was the run when it all fell apart. I hadn't realized this yet, but do you see it? My slimes aren't moving, and neither are my skeletons. Something happened between when I booted up the game last time and this time. After trying to figure it out for a couple minutes, I realized that I was recording my work. If I rewatched the last bits of it, I could see the mistake. But no such luck. I hadn't done anything with the animation players for the past couple hours, let alone past 10 minutes. And animation players were definitely the problem. The enemies were moving and attacking me, but their animations weren't playing. Eventually, I figured out what the problem was. It was that Godot had changed the path to the properties I was animating, so instead of just animated sprite position, it said Guardian animated sprite position for all of the enemies that used this animation player, while well, not all of them were Guardians. With one hour left, I threw in the towel and decided not to submit the game to the jam, but release it when it's ready. 
So what I decided to do with my newfound freedom is the favorite pastime of any developer, refactoring code. Now I'm not going to look back to be accurate when I'm dissing myself, but trust me when I say that the inheritance structure in this game was horrendous. The player node didn't inherit from anything, but rather had duplicate code from the skeleton node, which inherited from the jumping swipe node, which inherited from the enemy node, which theoretically would be what's known as an abstract class in a more rigidly object-oriented language, but was actually just a stationary swipe in my game. Now, there was method to the madness in the beginning because I layered functionality as I needed it, but now the obscure structure was just a liability. The plan now was to have a proper abstract actor node, which wouldn't be instanced by itself, but rather would be inherited by the player and all the enemies. So after countless hours of moving code around and implementing things I'd already made, I was finally able to replace all the old enemies with new and barely improved ones in the level and delete the old scenes and scripts, since I would no longer be needing them. A good thing did come out of all of this, I think, in the new movement animations, especially with the move up animation, which previously looked too robotic. Even though it's not necessarily how a real top-down jump would look like, the new animation brings the actor down a little bit before accelerating up really fast. I also scale the sprites at the highest point in the jump now, which is not really noticeable but makes the movement a little more dynamic. With all the old problems out of the way, I was able to start working on new features. I added health bars to the enemies and drew the portal that would take the player to the next level. I wanted this level to be on a floating island in the sky and to look totally different from the first level, so I decided to kind of flip the palette. So whereas in the first level the environment was in the cold bluish colors and the player and enemies were in the warm reddish colors, this level would be the opposite. Reddish clouds and towels in the back and bluish player and enemies in the front. For the clouds I would have two parallax backgrounds. And parallax backgrounds are basically sprites that follow the camera, just slower to provide the illusion of distance. The reason I have two is twofold. First is that one set will appear closer, and the second is that the closer clouds will cover my utter lack of imagination, since half the clouds in the back look like cloud-shaped animals. With the background out of the way, I was able to start working on the boss fight, which would be Two-Face. First, the player would have to defeat two golems, which had to look super cool, so I made them inactive at first, and made a rising from the ground animation for them. After the player defeats the golems, the second phase starts where he has to dodge spikes coming out of the ground in different arrangements. Now I don't exactly know if this was one of my brightest ideas, but each spike was a separate node. And with over 200 spikes in total, I would have to do some optimization for the first time ever later. For now it didn't seem like a problem. I also didn't want the golems to be boring like the rest of the enemies, and since I already had the spikes, they could interact with each other. Instead of the normal attack everyone else had, the golems wouldn't attack the player unless he was directly in range. Instead, they would raise three spikes in line towards the player, this way you couldn't run in a straight line from them. As for the spike phase, it would have three distinct sub-phases. In the first, all of the spikes would alternate, so the player just had to keep moving on every beat. On the second, the player would have to dodge a wall of spikes, and the third would combine both of those, with the player dodging a wall of spikes while moving on every beat. The problem here was that you couldn't really see the spike wall coming at you while the rest of the map also pulsed with spikes, so I solved this by highlighting the wall. Since after the spike phases were done, the player would be able to finally kill the boss, I was nearing the end of development. And here, while testing the game in window mode, I realized I had some serious optimization issues. While the FPS set at a constant 60, as it's supposed to, the game would occasionally stutter, meaning frame times were spiking. This is going to get a little technical, so let me explain. A frame time is the time it takes for the game to draw a frame. For silky smooth 60 FPS, every frame time should be 16 milliseconds. But that's not the only way you can get 60 FPS. You can have 59 frames that take 12 milliseconds to render, and one frame that takes 200 milliseconds. 
That's what was happening here. Way too much stuff would happen at the same time, which would slow the game down just for a little bit into a stutter. It would deal with it and then run smooth until the next time too much stuff happened. Now, normally, when I want to pretend like I know what I'm doing, I will look at the monitors. But in this case, they were of little use. I had no idea what was causing the stutters. This is when I discovered the holy grail of graphs, the Godot profiler. Not only does it show the spicy stuff like frame times, but you can look at what calls are being made frame by frame. How cool is that? This was a really fun problem to have, and at this point I was like, look at me, I'm a game developer. Soon enough, I figured out that all of the spikes had their animated sprites playing at the start and all made the animation finished call at the same time, even though, even though they started on the last frame of the animation with their animation whoop turned off. And that they had their physics process running when I didn't technically need it. With the stuttering issues solved, the game was pretty much done. I just had to make an intro cutscene to explain what was going on. Which brings this video to a close. A Crypt of the Necrodancer kind of clone made in a week. If you'd like to play the game, a link to the browser version will be in the description. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one.